we are live, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, Vijaya, ma'am, uh, for gracing this occasion. Uh, Today, 16th edition of uh, the Cedrus Knowledge Series uh, will be a little different. It will be in a different format. Uh, typically, you see me along with the speaker. Uh, but as the topic uh, revolves around women, we will have a session conducted purely for the women and by the women. So uh, uh, it will be an all-woman show. Uh, we at Cedrus believe in competence. Uh, and I must acknowledge uh, that the 40% of our staff uh, who are women uh, are as competent and as men, uh, not lesser than them. Uh, in fact, in terms of uh, soft skills, empathy and sincerity, uh, I would definitely rate them better than women, uh, uh, than men. Uh, so without wasting any more time, uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, there are a lot of questions to be asked to Vijay, ma'am. Uh, I would now hand it over to uh the session open to all the wonderful ladies uh isha please take over okay sir thank you a very warm welcome to all our viewers to the 16th edition of cedrus knowledge series an initiative wherein we will have one expert each month speaking on a variety of topics ranging from investing to well-being we will now play a video to introduce cedrus wealth partners Thank you, Isha, for the lovely introduction. A very warm welcome, Vijaya, ma'am, and to all our speakers and our viewer. Uh, it is indeed an honor to have you with us today. For our viewers, this is a moderated session where we will ask Vijaya, ma'am, our set of questions. Uh, if you all have any questions, meanwhile, you can post them in the comment section and we will take them towards the end. Uh, ma'am, you are the ex-Secretary Defense of Finance and also a member of the Telecom Authority of India. Uh, going through your career, I'm sure you must have come across many hurdles and barriers. How did you overcome these? Uh, did you face any gender biases throughout your journey? And how did you handle them? Um, you are starting with really a very uh, interesting question, I must say. Actually, you see, as you introduced me, I belong to a service. I retired as secretary in the defense finance. I joined the civil service called Indian Defense Account Service. And as all of us are aware, you know, the defense, the defense sector, which is consists of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Defense Research and Development, you know, all other organizations which are attached, the ordnance factories, etc. They are highly technology oriented. And of course, because of the strategic uh, nature of the defense ministry also, like, you know, Earlier, my even though my service, Indian Defense Account Service, was almost 200 years old because it started during the East India Company, the ladies as such in the Defense Account Service were actually started, they started recruiting ladies only from 1962 onwards. So the first lady we had was a batch of 1962. 
slowly of course we started because you see accounts is a service which uh, normally is easier for ladies to prefer like you know i can tell you that i was brought up in a very um, a conservative kind of an atmosphere and i do remember though my brother was in the indian administrative service my father insisted that i should only opt for account services because basically you know there is no public dealings in account services so as far as the police service was concerned he said no income tax he said no so i just filled in for the account services so i joined the indian defense account service in 1974 and i must tell you that the year we i joined also it was quite about more than four decades earlier it was very difficult because ladies were very few and even though even in the mess the army mess which we used to dine as members because we were uh, trainee officers and we didn't have the arrangements for kitchen etc we were not allowed in the main dining table there was always a separate room you know called the ladies room so basically the members were only the army officers and the ladies who were sort of happened to be somebody's wife etc who were you know traveling or visiting the officer or they were coming to the mess they had a separate room where they used to dine so of course it took a lot of time like uh, you see my first posting after my training was in the navy that is naval accounts that the headquarters of the navy's accounts is in mumbai opposite the corporate uh, grounds now we were supposed to learn the audit you know we were supposed to basically audit all the issues and receipts taken on charge etc and i was not allowed on board a ship because you know ladies at that time were not allowed on board ship you are quite aware actually that uh, how much time it has taken for ladies to be joining the armed forces now initially they were only in the medical services or the mns you know which is called the military nursing service you never had ladies in the main arms or services which has taken quite some time and initially of course they were only what is called as given short service commission with a lot of fight now you find that you know we have achieved this much in the last say five decades that now we have even women as fighter pilots so it is quite a journey and i am sure that you know even now numbers of number of women are so less in every aspect of the indian defense whether it is the air force or the army or even the service to which i belong so uh, i mean i see the it, it's not exactly a gender bias i would say that you know there is a kind of condescension you know when a woman is sitting uh, behind let's say that you are sitting in a position where you are you know like for example my job involved sanctions approvals you know major platforms thousands of crores of expenditure i had to really approve or recommend whatever depending upon the powers given to us so you know you will always find the condescension oh what is she going to understand about an aircraft or what would she understand so you know it is something that you have to perhaps work hard i wouldn't say that see i did rise to the top of the service so i wouldn't really say that it's not imp- it's not impossible for a woman to rise but i think there is a bit of a struggle basically because of i think condescension you know of men because if you say something or you ask some question you know they would you have to be very careful because if you ask a question on finance side as to why do you really want to spend so much money you know basically women are having that prudence you know that you know you don't want to spend money whether it is at home or you are going to spend the taxpayers money so if you are going to ask a question you know they would think how stupid can you be you know so that kind of a condescension is there but i think that if you work hard and you are confident and perhaps you do a bit of extra work because i think that wherever we have to we have to prove ourselves even though i always found that any organization which was actually headed where the lady was there the outcome and the output were much better but it has been achieved with lot of hard work i must say so i wouldn't really say that you know you shouldn't be worried about gender bias or people talking behind your back or you know some kind of gossip was they call you know like kiran bedi once said about booze buddies so if two three men you know talk about you or drink it should not really affect you as long as you are confident of yourself i think uh, you can overcome whatever bias it is right ma'am i think that's very inspiring and it's uh, uh, to begin with it has given us a very good perspective of uh, how women should face the hurdles which are inevitable in everybody's life uh ma'am you were an active member of many international and national forums and you represented india in the unicef uh you have also taken the lead for many management platforms uh through the advocacy programs for women uh you know 
uh, we hear that education is actually not just the learning of facts, but the training and the ability of the mind to think. Uh, what are your views on this? And how has your education and learning helped you throughout your journey so far? See, education is, you know, if you think education is just a formal education, that you have gone through the school, you have passed your 12th, you have went to, you know, you went to the college. I really don't think that is education. Because you see, if you see the previous generation to which I belong, I don't think my mother was that way formally educated. But I think, you know, what is really required is that you should have a basic literacy. And, you know, that really doesn't come only from books. Frankly speaking, you know, like, um, I mean, it is very difficult to think that just because you pass through a college or you have got an MA degree, you are going to be having wisdom because knowledge is not wisdom. As T.S. Eliot said, that you may be knowledgeable, you may be knowing a lot of things, but that doesn't give you wisdom. And you will always see that, you know, even the knowledge which you accumulate over, like, you know, why does the aeroplane fly or what is a gravity or, you know, those kind of knowledge which you see in the education system, which you have been having, that also is only information. See, that doesn't equip you to face situations in life. And I've always felt that, you know, a formal education doesn't really equip you to face situations because that is something which you have to work for yourself by experience, by the way you deal with, you know, whatever situations you are able to face. And that is really required, what is required to equip a girl child or when you are brought up as, you know, the even, of course, we know that in the families also many times the gender bias is there. Girls are not given the kind of not allowed to go out, you know, various situations. But I think basically if you are able to instill to that extent the confidence in a girl child when, you, when she is growing up, that it is not just that you have to have a formal education and get a degree, but you have to be equipped to face life. I think that is what is important. And I would say that uh, the education mm -hmm. in the school, which is just, you know, making you pass the CBSE or the other boards, etc., is not what is required. The new education policy, which is being now introduced, I think, because of the COVID, I think there is a lot of subjects in that which I have seen, which is perhaps, uh, you know, going to help the students. It is not just um, girls, but I think girls will certainly pick it up to get the kind of, uh, you know, independent thinking. What is required is that you need to be independent. You need to think for yourself. You don't have to always say, you know, okay, whatever is being told to you. And, you know, that's not what it is. You have to have to learn to think and you have to learn to make your own decisions, which I think is the most important. Right or wrong, you have to be equipped to make your decisions. And I think it is not just in, you know, your day-to-day -day life. But uh, as you are all there, you know, three of you are sitting there. I'm quite overwhelmed by seeing you. So the decisions of how you are going to manage your finance, how you are going to face life, you know, what is it that you are going to do with all the income which you are bringing to the family table? You know, all those decisions also have to be instilled. And I think that kind of illiteracy will really help you to make independent thinking. Absolutely, ma'am. And... Uh... The education today is the key element for shaping all our young women out there who are the future of India. So it's uh, extremely important for our education system to include all these points which you mentioned. Coming from there, ma'am, uh, you also edited and released a book called Ananya on the occasion of Women's Day on the 8th of March 2009, uh, which was in collaboration with the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. Uh, this book documented the journey of the Indian woman with a special focus on the girl child. Uh, could you give us some highlights from this book and does it relate, how does it relate to the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign? Yeah. See, Unity, you know, I have spent uh, most of my service career in the Ministry of Defense because as I said, I started my career with the Navy. Then later I went into the army accounts. Then I went to the Ordnance Factory Board in Calcutta. Then I did what is called as border roads. So most of my career in the initial stages were basically in the defense and I took over as joint secretary in the Ministry of Defense Finance. But, you know, I have I was very lucky to have exposure to the social sector when I was posted as additional secretary in the Ministry of Women and Child Development. And I must tell you, it really changed my perspective because I had never known, I must confess, because you see, I'm a big city girl. I was born and brought up in Mumbai and I belong to a very small family. I had an elder brother. And uh, somehow, you know, the um, upbringing which I had, I must say that I did not find any gender bias among my parents. 
because originally we belong to you know the, what they say in kerala you know there is a kind of matrilineal uh, society because you know in kerala the women always inherited the land even earlier because of the the reforms which they had and also the tradition which they had so i never faced any gender bias in my house but i must tell you that once i went into the women and child development ministry's additional secretary i must tell you that i was shocked because i came to know how much of you know the gender adverse ratio because the girl children are not allowed to be born i mean i can only name the states and what really happens for example i came to know that in rajasthan you know they when a girl child is born they simply put sands in the nostrils of the girl child and kill that baby and in bihar and up what they do is they fill a huge vessel with milk and drown the girl child in that milk and you know in punjab as you are aware punjab haryana you know the gender ratio is so adverse as far as the women are concerned that even today many of the boys they import women you know you must have heard from other countries so that they can get married because there are there are not much women in the the ratio is absolutely adverse see in punjab what they used to do is you know a quack i wouldn't call him a, you know even a medical medically qualified person even as you know some amount of qualification but he will carry an ultrasound machine at the back of his you know scooter or motorcycle or whatever he will go to the houses of women who are pregnant and he will conduct an ultrasound and if he finds that the fetus is actually a girl you know it's a female fetus it will be pulled out in such a crude manner that you know even the women sometimes many times they even the ladies may not even survive see that is a kind of crude and you know the legislation had come you know that you are not supposed to do ultrasound you are not supposed to you know the prenatal determination of sex is not allowed but you see any amount of legislation on it will not be helpful It, because unless the implementation is really strict you know it has to be implemented and it is very difficult to implement all over you know in smaller places where there are hardly even any uh, you know doctors or like the hospitals you know you, if you it's a major hospital in the city maybe they won't do it but this is the kind of thing which was happening to the girl children and therefore you know we actually came out with a very beautiful logo for a girl child if you see it sometimes in the internet you will find there is a girl with a lot of zing you know trying to run into the sun because you know she is sort of seeing the sun and uh, we came out with this book ananya ananya means you know incomparable because you know a woman is incomparable i mean it is not just she is your daughter she is your sister she is your mother see all that is you know we speak but when it really comes to women you don't allow them to even born you know that is something which was really uh, sort of so i must say that national institute of design really helped us out there was there were two three like all of you are there here with nilesh there were a few wonderful ladies there and uh, we came out with that which was really it was it, even though initially we thought it will be a coffee table book but became so popular and you see i think uh, what is really required is there is a mindset change should happen and that kind of a mindset change cannot happen just by you know government it has to be happen with, with the society you know many um, i mean i have sort of worked with many ngos when i was in the ministry and i find many of them are really doing good work so it is there is there has to be a transformation of the mindset you know that girls are not going to be any way disadvantages to you and that is the reason why you have all these you know beti padao you know the, when you give education and equip a girl you know she understands she has confidence she is no longer going to be a burden because if you think the girl is burden the girl thinks she is a burden and you know that is the mindset in which she is grown up but with uh, you know what we have you know we have those anganwadis if you know the icds program in india is the largest such program in the country in the world actually what we do is that from 0 to 3 even lactating mothers are brought to the anganwadis and we give them iron tablets and whatever they need but even prenatal check up we do for them and 0 to 3 you know we look after the children we give them nutrition and 3 to 6 again they are given in the anganwadi they are taught also there is a classes which we take and we teach them like nursery you know in a private sector after 6 you have the right to education and they go to school and they have the mid day meals and of course they have the you know the scholarships they have you know for marriage they are most of the state governments have also followed the central government schemes in many ways i think it is improving and uh, maybe maybe a decade or two i'm sure that uh, you know our gender ratio which has been so adverse will certainly come
absolutely ma'am i think uh, uh, you know there has been some change which we are seeing in the society today uh, but you know this female feticide which is very uh, uh, common in the rural areas which is the mo- form the most uh, part of our country is still ex- in existence and you know what we see nowadays that there is a large gap in the uh, digital adoption a large gender gap between men and women uh, ma'am coming from here uh, what does it really mean to you know empower women digitally uh, in a context you know where traditional and cultural roles and norms still dictate a lack of societal value and rights for women uh, could you elaborate on the gender digital divide for girls and women and what is uh, one thing you know what are the, the barriers that are locking them out of the current economic system see basically you know um, the digital divide it has always been there actually it has never been that um, you know the technology or the te- the tools of technology women have always been deprived of if you really come to think of it you know i know when we actually we launched a program called sanchar shakti when i was member finance in the department of uh, telecommunications and we did it during one of the international women's day and at that time we happened to have a woman president so we had invited her to launch the sanchar shakti see what we had studied at that time was that women do not 30 to 40% of the women i am talking about 2010 11 did not have mobile phones and you know there was one mobile phone in the house which is always carried by the husband and the, you know what we did was it's see technology doesn't basically you see if you take go to, to core technology we also know that if you take what is called the science technology engineering and um, mathematics you know what they call as stem we do not find women representation at all see last year i remember that um, she may be also you know joining the audience today one of the professors uh, dr anita mangla she in this delhi university she had held a seminar on women in the scientific field and uh, you know we know that whether it is nobel prize or whether it is you know it is not something which is only peculiar to india in india it is much worse but if you see even internationally you do not find many women actually you know in this uh, what i call as stem you know science technology engineering and mathematics you do not find somehow it is always found that all these areas of technology is you know the prerogative of men i mean if you see core technology which is there but what you are calling about digital uh, technology what does it mean even uh, you know big firms like google or facebook now they call themselves meta you know it is not as if they have a large percentage of women in the core technology because if you take core technology it will be what artificial intelligence it will be machine learning it will be data science so it is all only male prerogative and even if you are women in those companies you will find they'll be doing hr you know they'll be doing some public relations they'll be doing some kind of uh, you know interaction with the public or some such thing you will never find them actually in the core technology area that is basically because i think the prejudice and even when you when they go to colleges you find in the engineering side also you find not many uh, you know ladies are coming because it is always found that uh, you know women are uh, going to do humanities they are going to do commerce you know they are going to do. so with that kind of thing that is what is actually no it will take a some time for us because it's as i said it's not something peculiar to india this you can find even internationally you will not you will not many you know find many women on the top in science even in foreign universities and the workshop which was held by the delhi university professor dr mangla you will be surprised that there were three women who spoke and all of them had gone and emigrated to europe or to the us they were not in india so you see the the atmosphere or the ecosystem which we give for women is much less and even in the tech companies they are only doing as i said you know public relations or you know they are in the hr department it's going to take a lot of time for them to get you know when it comes to the digital dividend see one thing is the formal education in technology which we really need to improve the other thing is giving digital dividend to women see for that you do not have to have formal education as i said when we did the sanchar shakti what did we do we use the self help groups because you know india is one of the countries which has a maximum number of women self help groups we must be having something like 7 to 8 million now and uh, you know each self help group will consist of some about 10 to 12 women and you know just by microfinancing giving them one mobile 
attaching them to what is called as the common service centers, which also we have a large number in the country, so that you know internet connectivity is given to the rural areas. That is under the Ministry of Information Technology, and we could equip them. And the Sanchar Shakti took off so well that uh, you know the TSPs, that is the telecom service providers, helped us. They gave what is called as value-added services. And you know, with Google's help and all the help you can have in the local language, because every person cannot understand English or you know whatever it is. Most of the women in those, and you know, it was so easy because I mean, simple things like you wouldn't believe how they use the technology was. In some places, there is no water tanker. You know, the water tanker doesn't come every day. It comes on alternate days. Sometimes it, does. and you know, women walk long. I mean, we in the city we don't understand the issues which are actually there at large. You know, in the country, and you know. These women, the water tanker will come, and one woman would see the water tanker. She'll immediately inform the entire group of their self-help group. Water tanker has come, so they could save time. You see, otherwise they'll go and wait there for hour, two hour. The water tanker wouldn't come; they'll come disappointed. So you know, these are the kind. So the use of technology is not really restricted, you know, to the only formal education. So what we have to do is we have to equip the women with technical tools. Simultaneously, also we have to ensure that you know we have the increased percentage in the STEM area. Right, absolutely, ma'am. And uh, you know you were just mentioning that uh, you know in the education and your sector also uh, with re respect to the STEM, there are quite few women as compared to men. And you know what we see is that even in the professional careers at the start, uh, women and men begin in parity with each other. But the C suit is still largely dominated by men. It's a men-dominated C suit positions. What we see today, there are comparatively fewer women role models and mentors also in finance, and you know this may account for some gender disparity at the top roles and positions. Uh, could you throw some light on this, ma'am? Uh, how is how big is this gender gap, and how can we minimize this with respect to the top positions and roles? It's a very good question, actually. You know, there are reasons for this. One thing is, you are absolutely right. When we start, most of us start at the same levels. What happens at some stage, the jump is there, and there is a total glass ceiling for the women. And the C suit, as you call CFO and you know CIO and CEO and all those Cs, you find only men, and hardly about 10 to 15 percent, perhaps, you will find women in the boardroom. I'm talking about our country, and it is not very high even in the Western countries. Let's not think that you know we are backward now. It is not so. Even in the Western countries, the CSU culture is very much there. No, there are reasons for it. See, sometimes I find that women themselves do not want to because you see, you have responsibilities. Once you get married, you have to bring up your children. Once you get, you know, you have to run a house. The running of the house is still very much. You know, even if a woman is working full time, running of a house is still very much con because you see, this is something which is instilled because right from times immemorial when man was there, you know, to go and hunt and bring an animal, it was a woman who was actually running the house. So you see, utilization, allocation, expenditure of the resources which was brought by a man was always done by a woman. So the running of the house, you know, is never the children. You see, biologically, we have to have. The children and biologically we have to bring up the children because you know i mean you know even for small things we all i mean even now we all, one always depended on one's mother you see i mean because the responsibility of a mother in bringing up the children is certainly much more than what the father does of course i must say that people are changing now because i find the younger generations i'm quite surprised i had some colleagues from ernest and young working with me in a project and i found that they were also fasting on karwa chaut very young people because you see they feel that they have to give equal so times are changing but not to the extent so what happens is many times the women themselves like for example if you see the children joining school as i told you that zero to six you know, when you zero to three and three to six, if you see the girl children, most of them leave at the age of, say, once they reach eight or nine standard, because they find that younger children are born in the house and the responsibility, if the mother is also working because at labor or whatever at level, you will find that the elder daughter, even if she's 10 or 11 year old, she is the one responsible for taking care of the younger siblings. So, you know, that responsibility is put in or whatever you say, pumped in or whatever you say, put into the children. So once, you know, that happens, even when we are, you know, in better jobs and most of the time you find that women themselves do not opt. Because I find if you go to a bank, 
earlier nowadays we are not going to the bank much but you you will find many ladies but you will hardly find a chief general manager or an executive director or you know at that level a woman dressing because most of them even prefer that they wouldn't want to you know appear for the higher examinations and upgrade themselves to officers because they are afraid that they will be posted out you know then they will have to leave so the responsibility of the home can never be and unless you know we take a policy stand or you know unless we are able to give that kind of a facility to the woman that no nothing will stop you from coming up see that and it is not impossible see if you decide to do something it is possible i just want to give you an example you see for a long time in the pnt that is i used to be looking after the post and telecommunication accounts of a service called indian post and telecommunication finance service so you know we have group a officers who are direct recruits and some promoters we have what is called as group b officers for a long time there was no promotion on the postal side for the group b people that is from group c to group b so you know it uh, more than i think 1000 or maybe more suddenly we changed the policy and we did a lot of hard work to give promotions to people because that is an incentive after so many years of service and you will be surprised to find that there are quite a lot of women in that and you know the women came and met me and said madam if we have to get this posting promotion then we'll have to be posted out and we do not want the promotion we are ready to you know serve at a lower level than you know suffer the transfers so i mean you know that if you are bold and you are able to take charge you can do it so i told them don't worry i will not transfer the women but i do not want the women not to get the promotion because it is their right they have earned it they have worked as much as the men and why is it that one so i see the constitution allows sometimes that you can give some special treatment to women so i said fine and uh, we issued the orders of course the men came and made a lot of noise but i wouldn't budge i said look at it this way that your own house your wife is transferred or your sister is transferred how difficult it is going to be and we are not so well off in the infrastructure in the departments in the government if she has to go and stay in a hostel or somewhere else it will be difficult for her. so i think you have to understand and we could succeed so what i mean is you see you need to give special facilities so that the women do not give up what is due for them so for rising in the service or careers as you are saying in the cu suits it takes a lot of sacrifice and it needs a lot of family support you know unless you have someone to take care in the house and you are confident see for hours you work together sometimes i used to be you know i had the um, what shall i say busiest desk once in when i was in the ministry of defense and i can tell you that 9 o'clock to 7 7:30 if you are all the time and you know you are dealing with huge amount of finances unless you are taken care that you know you don't have to worry about your home it is very difficult so mostly you find that women give up so i think it has to be a multi pronged kind of an approach we have to give facility we have to make an environment for women to come up so that you know the other way it's not impossible for because as i told you in the beginning itself any organization which is headed at the top by a woman you will find the outcomes are much better but we must allow and we must enable them to rise to that level absolutely ma'am and uh, you were just uh, telling about how the woman has to handle her house and uh, the work life balance which we speak about today uh, you know she has to take care of the family the social aspect and uh, but you know women are still three times as likely as men to say that you know they cannot afford to save for their retirement and uh, you know the situation is changing but still they have significantly lower rates of financial literacy per se or uh, uh, you know women generally speaking earn less save less and uh, uh, you know they are still responsible for the same living expenses of the fina- uh, uh, the finances of the family uh, overcoming these obstacles you know demands for serious dedication and planning with respect to the financial literacy so how can a uh, woman uh, handle these obstacles owing to the paradigm shift especially after the pandemic uh, you know we see work from home has taken uh, you know ha- has been enabled in most of the companies how can women uh, uh, handle these obstacles and how can we ensure that the financial literacy for women uh, uh, get, improves over a period of time oh very comprehensive question very uh, very comprehensive uh, okay see first and foremost i can tell you one thing that all those women who are employed and you know who bring some contribution to the table of the house most of them just give it to the common pool or to the husband or to the whoever is the head of the if there is a father in law or whoever is running the house 
and um, they really don't think the money which they have earned is theirs because again it is the psychology you see because if a woman is given money she it is for the family right so what happens is most of them you will find that uh, they stand in front of uh, their husbands or you know the head of the house and say okay today i need pocket money i need to go I, you know that's the kind of because whatever they bring they really do not get to use what they bring that again is because of the mindset you know that you know whatever the woman earns is for the family and the woman also believes in it now there has to be as you said a paradigm shift to equip women to say that no your money i mean i'm not saying that they should create any rift in the house that women should keep her money separate or something not that but certainly she should know what she is earning where is it going how is it invested how much return is it going to give and how much is it going to give it to her and what kind of you know utilization of that money is for her and for her needs and whatever she feels is the common need of the house see that much of thing it will be you know as i, I really agree with you you need a paradigm shift for this i think the only thing which perhaps we could do is you see we are not going to so any seeds of you know um, sort of uh, saying that no no my money is not that we are not going to so any seeds of any kind of disquiet in the family but this kind of an education is required and uh, honestly speaking i'm so happy to see three of you with uh, nilesh because you see you are the persons who are now going to advise you know other ladies that how is it that they are going to increase their wealth and i always feel that you know you will always think that see they have they know they know how to save because i think the basic instinct of women is to save you see you will be surprised that um, you know when the demonetization suddenly struck because one fine evening our prime minister announced from 12 o'clock onwards all your 500 rupee notes and 1000 rupees are no longer legal tender now i have a few relatives you know who are actually uh, their husbands are engaged in some kind of business etc and you will be surprised that uh, i used to get telephone calls from many of them whatever relationship they called me like mommy or whatever i had some 75000 rupees in the artika dabba you know i have so much money in the rice ka dabba because you see what happens is those whenever the husband comes and gives money because business people they are always you know a bit of insecure so when the money comes you will find that either the woman makes some jewelry and you know purchases some gold or she keeps the cash because suddenly it may be required any time and you know even as I men i still remember that most of us even now i don't know but see we always used to tug at our mother's pallu and say please give me some extra money even though we knew that the father is the breadwinner mother is at home but we'll still ask her i need an ice cream with my friends so please give me and your mom will come out with some money from some dabba or somewhere in the kitchen you see so the saving instinct is always you know inbuilt in a woman but unfortunately how to get return out of that the literacy which is there that is lacking so that is how you find you know old notes coming out of artika dabba etc you know that is where i really found that as you very rightly pointed out literacy financial literacy independent thinking which will empower the woman to use the amount whatever whether it is her earnings or whether it is a husband's earning which have been given to her she has to take care of it and i think that education has to be given right from the school this is what i feel because unless you are able to see in the new education policy i said that there are some you know issues where you can do that and i think it is all the, you know the social media is helping a lot i must say now and also you know women like you and you know your colleagues in the office you are the persons who are going to help these you know women to understand as to how to make more money out of their money and not just you know keep it uh, in some kind of a which doesn't produce any returns for them absolutely ma'am i think uh, you were just mentioning that uh, in some families women just uh, give their earnings to the head of the family and they do not uh, use the money just because the financial literacy is lacking uh, uh, you know we have seen the change which is coming uh, but with this financial literacy one question what arises to my mind is the financial inclusion uh you know while there are many different theories of change uh, for women's economic empowerment uh you know there are three elements income control and the power to make decisions uh, uh you know this actually has a cultural aspect also linked to this and uh, what happens is women have been conditioned all their lives to believe that they have no agency and control of the finances of the family so how can women seize the opportunities what is available today and build resilience and take control of the finances uh, could you throw some light here ma'am 
Yeah. See, uh, I mean, as you mentioned sometime uh, in the previous question or interaction with me, I should say, because certainly you are doing it so well. It is an interaction. It is not at all. And so what I really wanted to tell you is, see, I have found some change. And the change which I have found is because of the pandemic. Because, you see, one is, of course, physically women have... You know, it has helped a lot for women because who used to go to office and, you know, go all the way. Like, for example, in Mumbai, etc., local trains, you find people going from Dombivili, Kalyan, you know, traveling for hours, one hour, one and a half hours in the crowded train, coming back home. While coming back home, I found many of them, you know, chop the vegetables and carry it to their home so that by the time they go home, they reach their houses, they can simply put the vegetables for boiling, etc., etc. So that kind of a thing, you see, you will find that um, since that physical work, you know, going to the office had stopped during the pandemic, you found that a lot of women got into the technology. And, you know, not only those people who are working, but what really surprised me was not even those who are working. They could use the social media. See, now you really need to have internet, of course. Internet is a must. You just need to have a smartphone. And I find that many women now are coming up on YouTube, teaching you, you know, how to make tomato soup, how to make this item, how to have a long, thick hair, you know, how not to make your hair gray you know all uh, how you know they teach you lifestyle uh, how to you know make up i find that just they all put it on the youtube and you know i find that they say that please uh, subscribe to my channel and you know please um, sort of um, like my whatever posted and i understand that the youtube is able to give them some income because the number of hits which they have and you will be surprised i mean forget about women you know who are doing this because they have understood the use of technology and they are utilizing it very very you know fruitfully to them my 14 year old uh, you know granddaughter she has a youtube channel you know, that is the next generation which is coming, which is totally, you know, and um, uh, sometimes, you know, she is into gaming. And then she also has a channel in which she posts all kinds of, you know, her own blogs. And uh, one, one time my son-in-law told me that uh, Premada has earned so much. So what, you see, what has really done in this, during this pandemic is that since physical going to work is not required you know women have started finding out methods of making money out of using the technology and i can tell you that they are not even you know like we said no that they are not they don't have that you know knowledge that they have not got the you know total they have not gone for a formal education but still they are able to use the technology of youtube or you know post something and then make out so i think the times are changing and you know every aspect of it is adding and I think women are getting more and more included, no? Because I found in the last two years, the amount of YouTube channels which I've seen from the women coming is something which is mind-boggling. So I think that, uh, you know, it is helping. Technology is helping. And I think more utilization of technology and formal education is going to certainly help much, much more. Absolutely, ma'am. Uh, what you were saying regarding the social media, uh, it's thrown up the thought of options and opportunities for the women out there uh, who are able to now turn into entrepreneurs. Like, uh, you know, a new generation of uh, entrepreneurs can be found on Facebook and Instagram and they are able to, you know, launch their websites and do business and, you know, surpass the social restrictions. Like we can see many women have established businesses selling handicrafts, food, clothing and accessories, etc. So, uh, you know, here, I would like to mention how can the financial service level the playing field for women and how will this lead to an equitable impact in the future? See, it will lead to an equitable impact because, I mean, as you said, see, you now do not need to have an office. You do not need to have a launch a business. You know, all that you need to have is a laptop or a mobile phone. And you are straight away on Instagram. You see, earlier, you know, I'm talking even about not women who are, let us say, middle class or, you know, but even rural women now. I mean, the, I told you about Sanchar Shakti. You see, rural women learn to use the mobile. And, you know, like, for example, fisher, fisher women, you know, what is the cost of the fish which they are going to sell? See, they could exchange. If somebody is making some handicrafts, you see, it could, it could produce them and give them linkages, you know, both forward and backward linkages. See, earlier some middleman will go collect it and give them much less price and he will go and sell it in the market at a much higher price. But now you know that they whatever they make, even if it's an embroidered item or whatever, if it is a sari which they have woven, but you find that suddenly they're putting it on the website and you know the cost of the sari and you get the sari. But earlier there were always middlemen who will go exploit these women 
give them much less price for what they have labor and what their material or whatever they have worked on and sell it at a much higher price. So now you find that that completely is gone because they just know how to use technology and um, especially because now the language is also not a barrier. Because they have the local language, some amount of education has helped them. And you know, the other thing is, of course, you know, that you do not have to really read or write. You can just listen because you just put the voice on and then you are able to do it. So they're able to understand the cost at which they should sell and they're getting the benefits out of it. So that is something which, you know, the, as you said, whether it's Instagram or whether it is Facebook, it has really helped a lot. It is not just only middle class women who are teaching you about YouTube, but it is also these women who have now gained. So that way it has really helped, you know, and I think that uh, things will be better because the more and more knowledge spreads, it is always that, and you know, woman can never sit idle. So she will always talk to other people, find out what is happening, how to increase the income, because I have seen with my experience that if you give 20,000 rupees microfinance to a woman, she will find out method by which she should earn more. And whatever she earns, you see, it goes to the family it goes to the children it goes to educate them we gave you know we used to give funds um, microfinancing which we had a big workshop and we started giving microfinance to self help group i visited some of them and i you know one lady was telling i said what are you going to do with the money she said i will send my daughter to the convent school see that is the kind of thing so you know if you give if you give anything to a woman you see it is always the it is a family it is the community which gains that is the that is a difference. You know? It is not utilized otherwise. The next generation comes up. So I think uh, that way it is really helped out. Not just necessarily educated, but even the people in the rural areas. Absolutely, I think uh, uh, after after the, the shift in uh, technological aspect after the COVID, these opportunities have definitely helped women to take have a better position. Uh, you know, but what we see is that most technologies are developed by men and for men. Uh, the situation is getting better, but there is still a lot of room for improvement. And, uh, you know, to bring a structural change in the women empowerment, the gaps which still exist in our society today, uh, uh, you know, men also need to be involved somewhere in this process. Their conditioning also has to be changed so that there is an overall uh, uh, em woman empowerment. What is your opinion about this? And what can men do to make tech a better world uh, for women? Undoubtedly, Uniti, without men's, um, you know, unless you have an enabling atmosphere given to you by your father, your brother, you know, when you are when you're growing up in the house or your husband or in-laws, I don't think much can be. So, it, see, a patriarchal attitude will always ensure that a woman really does not realize her full potential. So, if her potential has to be realized, you know, first and foremost is that men have to change their attitude. And, um, you see, education... To a large, see the generation to which perhaps I belonged, you know, where they always thought that boys should not enter the kitchen or, you know, the, it is a girl's. I think that kind of mindset is changing now. And many of the, uh, you know, even private sector, even, you know, you are getting paternity leave for the fathers. You know, they are, they are learning to. I think the generation which is coming up, I'm really not, you know, that worried about because I do find that and it is not necessarily the generation which is coming up, but I think it is the mindset of a man. If he knows that woman is contributing as much and she needs help. So I think that really helps. So I, without contribution of men, I do not think that, you know. But uh, you see, I mean, you must have seen many movies. Like, for example, even traditional societies like Haryana, you find now that they are allowed to, you know, become sports persons. Women are coming up, you know. So I think, uh, you know, the, the social media has spread so much. That uh, the earlier, you know, that women used to be always in the house and looking at the, you know, inside the kitchen or something. I think that attitude is going. You find a lot of girls from Haryana now joining the various different sports, getting international uh, recognition too. You find even in the Northeast, you saw. So I think, you know, there is a mindset change and maybe it will take some more time. But I think I'm very hopeful and positive. Absolutely, ma'am. That's uh one thing which is very important for the whole uh, society, societal change to happen in uh, totality. Uh, that brings me to the last question for today, ma'am. Uh, what would be your advice and key takeaway for all, uh, you know, for the women of all strata, for the younger women out there, uh, women who are looking to grow their own business or within the company, and for women as a whole, what would be your advice? 
think the women of today like you are much better than the women of our generation you are all so confident you know you are absolutely equipped basically i just think that you know you should have self confidence in yourself the idea is that i can and i will you know nothing is going to stop you because if you get bogged down you know then the because i basically what i feel is you know like i used to be when i was much when i joined service and all i used to think you know there is a total mindset change required how are we going to achieve it but i think that if you work with confidence and you are not bogged down by you know whatever happens to you because you see you have to face situations it is not only i mean that way to some extent men too face but in a patriarchal society men you know are forgiven they are excused you know whatever little faults are there it is all overlooked but it is a woman who is always in the spotlight you see whatever you do however you do wherever you do or it is always you are in the spotlight so it is a fact that you have to really keep running to stay in the same place absolutely i have not had any doubt about it and as i said the kind of responsibilities and the kind of requirement which is expected you know the expectations out of a woman are certainly different from expectations out of a man and um, i also feel that women are basically equipped to face this this is what i feel because you see you have that um, you know you have that fortitude you have that basic you know idea in yourself that yes i can and i think that helps and i can tell you that the younger generation people like you i see i have absolutely no doubt that uh, we are really going to you know we are going to better the other western countries even i find you know because it's see whatever it is we do much harder work and that way i find you know that uh, it is not an exception that somebody is you know taken to international monetary fund or somebody you no know, i can tell you that we have that basic in in us and um, I, i really have a lot of hope in the younger generation i i can just tell them go for it that's a uh, wonderful session ma'am i think it's given such a lot of positivity to all those women who are watching us today and it was such a thought provoking and such a insightful session i think uh, we all are filled with uh, positivity today uh, and it was a great session ma'am uh, i would now like to hand over to manju ma'am who would take us through the audience q and hi ma'am that was an extremely informative and insightful ma'am i'm sure it has helped all the various daughters of women in and to think positive for themselves and now we move towards the audience q and a 52% of of young women group have experienced some form of digital harm and 87% of them the problem is getting worse there are many risks associated with di digital technology including online harassment from strangers cyber bullying cyber sexual messages images non consensual sharing of intimate photos child sexual exploitation and abuse as well as data security women and girls and people of diverse genders are at greater risk of digital harm there is a lack of formalized policies and regulations to prevent digital and protect us how can this risk be mitigated while bringing structural change for women in this digital age that's a very good question because you see technology while it is useful it is also extremely dangerous in the hands of people who are bullies who are hackers you know who want to destroy the privacy of persons it is extremely dangerous it is not just financial losses which happens my daughter lost something like 2.5 lakhs once to a credit card you know or some kind of a signature or whatever happened so what really see it is very very dangerous especially if you are not careful i mean all that i can say is because i also find let, let us be very frank so i also find many people post nowadays on facebook i'm leaving today i'm going out of the house i'm you know so many personal posts are being done you know you accept friends request carelessly without checking out so i think that you know there is no doubt that women are vulnerable much more than men it's not that men are not vulnerable 
fraud takes place, if financial fraud takes place, man also loses. But the kind of damage which can be done to a woman is something which is, you know, not the same because it can be really, you know, dangerous. And uh, many women, I think they uh, they have to be. So the only thing technology can be useful. See, you have to see it has got both the sides. It is useful. It is good. But it is equally dangerous. And I think for the dangers, it is like that. You see, I mean, many people say that why, why, are, why are we advised to be more careful you know, in making friendships, you know, in going out somewhere? You know, why are we? Why do we want to know? I mean, like if you have a young daughter or if you have a young girl, you know, your mother is more protective. That's because we are more vulnerable. See, you just cannot wish away that the gender as such which you belong to is more vulnerable. So, Therefore, we have to be more careful. But I think in the social media usage, I think I would really think that one has to be extremely cautious. And, uh, you know, all kinds of messages come to you. It is not necessary to reply. You know, the use of social media has to be very, very cautious. And see, the other day I had uploaded a paper in one of the blogs which I write that was about caution and convenience. See, for example, you are able to make payments, you are able to do e-commerce. It is so simple. You don't have to go out, just order online, pay online, Google pay. All that is true. But how much of caution you have to exercise while doing that? Because somebody says, pay to this account, open this. You open it and you pay the amount and it is gone. So similar is a question of making friends on social media. Similar is the question of you know sending messages, receiving messages, accepting, telling things about yourself, you know, that I'm leaving. I think one has to be extremely cautious because see, we cannot wish away the bad effects of this uh, thing in case we are you know, not careful. So I can only advise that you know be very cautious by using the social media. And ensure that you do not deal with strangers if you don't know them. Even on Facebook friendship, see, because people create fake accounts. You don't know on the other side, which is a man. The other day, I read somewhere that, a, you know, the senior person, some, one guy married some 20 people or something. Because you see, so what really happens is unless you do that kind of a proper due diligence, while well, you accept someone's request or you are on the social media, I think I can only advise caution because, see, you have to use technology. You cannot, but, you know, you cannot just live without it. But then you have to be cautious. And then I also want to know, ma'am, like, uh, what institutional and societal changes need to be made and accepted to empower women? See, institutional changes is that we have to educate them. Because unless there is an education, which, I mean, as I said, we are able to do it. Institutional changes, I mean, the government is doing a lot by giving various kinds of grants. But social changes, you know, it has to come. Like even now you find, I mean, uh, you know, if a girl is considered as a burden because there is a dowry demand, you know, the off late, of course, we find. So domestic violence, you know, ladies are put into because they are actually told that, okay, a husband and wife quarrel is not something which has to be complained to the outside. So you see, we what we did was we said, okay, bell bajao campaign we did and said if somebody is beating his wife in the next door, go and ring the bell in his house so that he stops. And one of my colleagues in TRI told me that one BSF officer, you know, an officer belonging to border road, border security force was beating his wife in a very you know senior government colony in Lodi Road, and these people use that Bel Bajau campaign. So I think, you know, it has to be governmental efforts. It has to be societal efforts. It has to be neighbors. It has to be a whole multi-pronged, you know, what shall I say, strategy. So that, you know, we are able to put that. And I think education to a large extent will help women, which we are now going with the Right to Education Act and the known meal scheme so that we are able to give food to the children who are coming. If these schemes are implemented properly, I think, uh, you know, like she said right in the beginning, beti bachao, beti padao, you know, these things will certainly help the girl children. Ma'am, with this thing comes to an end. So on behalf of Cedrus Well Partners, I would like to thank you for making the time to grace this event. And to our viewers, for tuning in large numbers and making this event success. We will return to speaker. Until then, stay healthy, stay and happy listening. And thank you so much, ma'am.
that was a thank amazing you. session ma'am thank you thank you all ladies you know who are strength behind nilesh and i really admire nilesh that you know he sort of put all of you and i could meet all of you thank you so much and all the best thank you ma'am it was indeed an honor to have you with us yeah. thank you bye. so much bye, bye ma'am bye